when, when we were teenagers, Daddy would take us to a camp called the Wilds in Brevard, North Carolina, and they had this thing called the swing. And it was more than just a normal, regular swing. It, I don't know, 2,000 foot tall, felt like, I don't know, there was helicopters flying underneath it, I remember that. But it would, you'd strap into it, two or three of you would get in this thing and they'd strap you together, then all of a sudden they'd push you and you'd be down and they, uh, it, all of a sudden you'd start hearing the clicking and that thing would pull you all the way back um, to the very top and uh, I guess in order for them to let you feel like you were in control, the last little uh, request they made for you was they put a little red cord in front of you. And while you're way up there, you have to pull. <laughs> on, I get my stomach's upset just thinking about it. And I remember being the preacher's kid, the pastor's kid. Uh, and I remember them giving this big speech about profanity and bad words and how tempted people are when they get up there. And I remember thinking, that ain't going to be no problem for me, man. I, I'm a preacher's kid. I don't say bad words. But one of the worst spankings I've ever gotten in my entire life <laughs> was from being about 15 years old at church camp and pulling that red cord and losing complete control of the situation. And I ain't got to go no further than that. But I said something I should, because I lost control. And if you live long enough, you're, not, you're going to know what it's like, whether you pull the cord or somebody else pulls the cord on you, uh, for you to lose control of circumstances. What do you do when, you're out, when things get out of control? I want to invite you to turn with me to the book of Genesis, chapter number 13 to the story of Abram and Lot as their both sides of their lives are being blessed. And while their lives are being blessed, Abram's blessings are getting massive and Lot's blessings are getting massive to the point that they cannot cohabitate together in that land. Their herdsmen are striving against each other and Lot makes the statement, hey, you choose, you go one way, I'll go the other way. We don't have to be enemies in this, we're brothers. Uh, but in that, Abram loses some control. Look with me in Genesis chapter number 13. If you don't have a copy of God's Word, it's on the screen for you. And Abram went up out of Egypt. He and his wife and all that he had and Lot with him into the south. And Abram was very rich in cattle and silver and in gold. And he went on his journeys from the south even to Bethel unto the place where his tent had been in the beginning between Bethel and Hai. Unto the place of the altar which he had made there at the first. And there Abram called on the name of the Lord. And Lot also which went with Abram had flocks and herds and tents and the land was not able to bear them that they might dwell together, for their substance was great, so they could not dwell together. And there was strife between the herdmen of Abram's cattle and the herdmen of Lot's cattle, and the Canaanite and the Perizzite dwelled there in the land. And Abram said unto Lot, there be, let, let there be no strife, I pray thee, between me and thee, and between my herdmen and thy herdmen, for we be brethren. Is not the whole land before thee? Separate thyself, I pray thee, from me. If thou wilt take uh, the left hand, then I will go the right hand. And if thou depart to the right hand, then I'll go to the left. And Lot lifted up his eyes. And Lot lifted up his eyes and beheld all the plain of Jordan, that it was well watered everywhere before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah, even as the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt, as thou comest unto Zoar. And then Lot chose him all the plain of Jordan, and Lot journeyed east, and they separated themselves, the one from the other. Abram dwelt in the land of Canaan, and Lot dwelled in the cities of the plain. Father, I pray you'd bless your word for a few moments tonight, this morning, rather. I pray, Lord, that you'd speak to our hearts through your infallible word, I pray, Lord, for that church member here today that's been grieving over making a decision. I pray, God, you'd give them clarity today. 
I pray, Lord, for that one that's been battling with strife at their place of employment. Pray, God, you'd give them clarity today. I pray for that one that feels walked out on. I pray, God, you'd give them encouragement today. And Lord, we'll be very careful to give you the praise, the glory, and the honor for us. It's in the name of Jesus we pray and all God's people said. What to do when it's out of your control. Abram faced a situation where he could not control Lot's decisions. Lot chose the well-watered plains of Jordan because they seemed more appealing. We, number one, what to do when things are out of control. R write this down if you're taking notes today. It'll be on the screen. There, number one, remember that adults have a free will and even God will not violate that. Let me make, a, let me make a, a, a big statement. A lot of anxiety comes from us trying to play God over other people's lives. Things get out of control. Things get into chaos. Things start spinning. And uh, I won't do it, but I'm sure if I asked you to raise your hands, a lot of people would testify to being a fixer. Uh, a better word than that at times is a manipulator where we want to get involved and we want to work things and most of the time we don't just want to work and fix it we want to work it and fix it to our agenda what to do when things are out of your control number one you got to remember that adults have a free will and not even God will violate that free will God who is full of love and full of mercy, created mankind with a free will. He had angels that worshiped him day and night and night and day uh, because they had to, and God created mankind with a free will. He's not going to make you love him. He's not going to make you choose him. He's not going to make you serve him. But he desires those to choose out of love and understanding to love God and to serve God. But here in this circumstance, we see, number one, free will in activity. Free will in activity uh, as there's some boundaries that are starting to get placed down as uh, Abram realizes we, we can't do this together no more. We're too big. We're striving. Uh, our cattle need grass to eat. We've got to separate and spread out. But as soon as that happens, Lot begins to make choices that are not good choices. Lot starts making choices to, uh, to, to go near Sodom and Gomorrah and all that goes with that. And, 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 and so Lot, uh, making these bad decisions, can you see Abram? Biting his tongue. As if he could tell him, you, you don't want to go there. You don't need to do that. But, but instead, you, we, we see a firm understanding here that, that, that God has given us a free will and that not even God will violate. And if, and if God has put boundaries there to where he won't violate a man's free will, then don't you think that would probably be a good principle for us to put in our life as well? This free will and activity, these boundaries, even God respects the free will of individuals. Abram couldn't impose his will on Lot. Uh, and, and we must understand that if God is letting people make choices, sometimes you've got to let people make choices too. God has given people their own free will. God has given me my own free will. And sometimes it's not the easy road. Sometimes it's not the happy road, but every now and then people have got to learn on their own. One of my issues with a legalistic environment where we just train even extra biblical rules on people instead of connecting them to the Bible and the presence of the Holy Ghost is what is a child going to do when they turn 18, 19, 20, or 15, 16 for that matter, and mom and dad can't be there to tell them what the rule is? I believe it is more important that we 
seek after a God that will get involved in their heart to the point that when mom and dad are not there to tell them the rules that the Word of God is ruling in their life and that the Spirit of God is ruling in their life that can have an effect and an influence on the free will of a man or a woman. God has given us that free will. I believe that's why as parents we must raise our kids to love Jesus and not just church. I'm going to say that again. I believe we've got to raise our kids to love Jesus and not just church. The South is full of churchianity instead of Christianity. The South is slapped full of a religion instead of a relationship with Jesus Christ. What will affect this uh, free will? I believe that the presence of God will have an influence on the free will of a man or a woman. Uh, but I wonder how many of us at times have been guilty of going after the free will of another person. At the end of the day, all I can do is change me. Anxiety comes when I try to control everything and everybody else in this world. For a marriage that's struggling in this room, we've heard it till we're blue in the face. It's true from the top to the bottom. You can't change your spouse. You can't turn them into that new, better version that you want them to be. But here's what, I, here's what you can do. You can turn yourself into that new, better version of you. And then you can pray for God to move and to work and for them to become the person that God wants them to be. God has given them the free will, and I believe it causes us great levels of anxiety when we try to be God. I was preaching in a little church uh, years ago, and a mother walked up to me as, about five minutes before church, and she said, Oh, preacher CT, I'm... My boy has finally come to church. He hadn't been to church in years. And he's been watching you on YouTube every now and then. And he says he likes to hear you preach. And he finally came to church. She said, please preach on heaven or hell or do whatever. My boy's lost and don't know Jesus. Please make sure my boy gets saved today. <laughs> no pressure, right? I went up there and I remember I prayed, Lord, that mama put a lot of faith in me. Lord, please. I pray, God, you deal with that boy's heart as I try to preach. And I'll never forget, I, I, I was preaching around on the subject of Calvary and the blood of Jesus. I'm doing everything I can evangelistically to, to get a hook in that boy and to reel him in for the gospel's sake. But every time I'd say something about the blood of Jesus or the forgiveness of sin or repenting from, from your sinful ways, that mama on the back row, I lie not, that mama on the back row would take that elbow and ugh, right in the side of her son as if she's saying, listen to what the preacher is saying. I'd back up and I'd go a little bit more and I'd say God can save anybody anywhere anytime no matter who you are where you've been what you've done no matter where you come from God can save you and, and mama in the back Ugh. after about four and five punches to the gut I finally thought I'm gonna quit preaching because that boy can't take no more I thought what a mistake at the end of the day because if Mama and me were to go get the 12 strongest men in that church and go pick him up and drag him to the altar. That still ain't going to save him. We're not after the actions of men. We're after the free will of men. That the Holy Ghost would so temper and convict and draw. That's what I love about the Holy Ghost. You say, why do you go through all that work to go to Bristol and preach? Because there is nothing in this world that excites me any more than to watch the Holy Ghost of God go to convicting and wooing and moving and watch somebody that walked under that tent hard-hearted. There was a man that came one night last week and I could tell when I shook his hand, he had liquor all over his breath and he came to the tent absolutely drunk. You say, you want people there like that? 
oh yeah and they're welcome here too somebody say amen he, he, he came inside there and man I got to preaching the gospel and I noticed about twice while I was preaching uh, he got up and just walked out of the tent my, one of my buddies up there is the head of security in that meeting and uh, I, after it was over I went back and said what that man say he said preacher he was squalling and crying he said I can't take it no more he said that preacher's all over me tonight he said he won't leave me alone he said everything he's saying it's like my mama told him everything I'm dealing with and that preacher's only preaching to me when in reality I didn't know that man's name I didn't know that man's circumstances I didn't know what he was going through but there was a God in heaven that knew him by name and knew what he was going through and had the ability to get after his and I'm telling you that's what we love about the gospel it has the ability to penetrate and melt the hardest of hearts and the coldest of hearts and bring them to a place of repentance if you believe that somebody praise the Lord free will and activity this free will and activation these kind of moments teach us to trust God's plan even when we cannot influence others decisions number one what do you do when things are out of control you remember that adults have a free will and not even God will violate that number two Recognize that God allows things or people to be removed from your life to build faith in Him and not in them. I'm going to read it again. Recognize that God allows things or people to be removed from your life to build your faith in Him and not in them. Genesis chapter 13, verses 11 through 14. Lot's departure was a pivotal moment for Abram, allowing him to focus more on God's promises. I don't know about you. Some people don't care. But one of the hardest things I've ever had to deal with in my life has been people walking away from me. I love people. I deeply love people. I genuinely love people. I like to feel that I'm a loyal person. And to the contrary, it becomes very difficult from childhood, whether it was a death in the family, whether it was the church I was raised in, and watching people walk out on our little church. And one Sunday, they can be best friends. And act as if, man, we're going to serve God together for the rest of our life and the rest of our world. And how in one moment, when somebody doesn't get their way, I'm going to preach to this stuff back here. And they see something fancier, newer, nicer. If I gave you a list of the stuff I've heard in my lifetime of why people left the church, you'd have to laugh to keep from crying. <laughs> well, I made macaroni and cheese for the dinner. And, and, and CT was bragging on Miss Kurt's cake and didn't say nothing about my mac and cheese. And I never even got my pan back after the church dinner. And I know Miss Becky probably kept it because it's Martha Stewart special exclusive edition. And I know Miss Becky probably has it in her cupboard. They said it ain't in lost and found. It's found. It's in Becky's closet. I know exactly where it's at. <laughs> Look here. Becky ain't got no cookware in the closet. I promise you that. Look here. And she may have a lot of things. She may have stole your shoes. <laughs> Becky's got a thing on the door that says, the only thing I make for dinner is reservations. Somebody say amen. And I love it. She's, she's pretty enough to dictate whatever she wants. Any ladies in the house know what I'm talking about. Recognize that God allows things or people to be removed from your life to build your faith in Him and not in them. They say, I was talking to a... a company in Atlanta that does a lot of our HR and helps us with a lot of finance and 
The head of that says that, he said this this week, that they, are, they say that we are currently employing the most ungrateful and least loyal generation of all time. A generation where employment rates are flipping over because they'll literally leave you to go make $1,000 right over there somewhere. We find this separation here. Many times, the person you think is the enemy, they're, they're not really the enemy. You were leaning on them too much. And God is a jealous God. And he wants your trust to be in him and not in them. So many times God will remove to refocus your trust. When I was, I don't know, in my early 30s and we started doing church camps, um, my dad, all my growing up years, he would just take us out of school and we go to church camp and my dad introduced me to something when I was a teenager called a water balloon launcher <laughs> yeah a water it was one of the most amazing inventions that that ever that ever been made uh, a thick rubber gauge with uh, I don't know probably eight foot long and a, a big uh, canvas pocket in the back with a, a grip on the back and you'd have to get those good water balloons and you'd fill them up to about the size of just a little bit bigger than a baseball. And I mean, you could have more fun with them things, knocking kids out that you don't like. Uh, and all my, all my childhood, I mean, <laughs> daddy would be in jail if YouTube was around uh, when we were kids. Uh, so I thought, well, daddy did it, I'll do it. Man, we got, we got to camp at one time, many of your young people were there. Uh, and, and we, we would get around, we'd make those water balloons and them kids that didn't go to sleep when we told them to go to sleep and them kids that gave us a hard time, we would target them and me and Josh and uh, Jared Dixon rather and Heath Williams and a bunch of guys that helped me at the time, we went over on the top of this hill and down in the valley was volleyball courts and a lake and there's kids fishing out of these little boats and then there's kids playing volleyball and there's uh, kids just running around I, literally at that time there were hundreds and hundreds of, it's like ants all over the place and I had a wonderful idea to get that water balloon launcher out and just rain them balloons where they would not even know where they're coming from and it don't make much noise if you don't hit them so we thought we'll have a good shot at it and uh, we pulled that thing all the way back and we had launched that balloon up in the air and man we missed more than we hit but uh, there was a few times that there was kids just walking around time and they, you know <laughs> they just go out and and that water balloon just I mean it was fun well <laughs> y'all pray for me <clears throat> and and send your kids to camp this summer all right <laughs> if they've been unruly I can fix it I promise you <clears throat> about that time the, the owners the owner of the camp his son saw what we were doing and he was probably my age he, he, he's country guy and he's trying to act real tough and he started noticing all the uproar of all the young people and he drove down that little gravel trail and got about a, a, a football field or so away from us and started revving up the engine of his truck as if he was saying I bet you can't hit me Well, now it's my personal mission. <laughs> and we started launching those things, and at that distance, it curves, and it's hard to hit. Well, he finally got braver, and he came closer and, and got about, I don't know, 50 yards from us and turned sideways and was, I mean, nah, you're doing everything he could to try to rile me up. And I, Lord, if you've ever helped me, help me right now. I let go. It was like slow motion on the movie theater. That water balloon with the perfect trajectory, about 450 miles an hour flying through the air. And I mean, it curves to the left, it curves to the right, and all of a sudden, he rolls the window down to his truck, 
And all I saw was that water balloon go through the front window of that truck and splatter all over the dashboard on the inside of that truck. Well, I think, oh, Lord, I'm in big trouble. I have now blew up a water balloon inside the owner's truck of the entire camp. They're going to kick us out of here. I didn't hear nothing out of that car. I would have thought he would have drove up immediately to us and laughed. But eventually, very slowly, that truck started pulling towards us. And the closer he got, the more I recognized something was bad wrong. That water balloon, at just the right time, had come. And when he opened the window, he went. (laughs) And right on the side of his face, from his eyeball cheekbone all the way down here, blood's pouring out of his nose, blood's coming out of his eye. And I think, oh, God, I'm going to jail. I'm going to jail. I'm going to jail. When we seen the blood, look here, a moment ago, There are 75 teenagers behind us making water balloons like a factory. We got organization. We got structure. We got all this stuff going on behind. Jared and Heath are like, get him, CT. Get him, CT. But as soon as I saw that blood, I knew we had to get him to the nurse's station. I said, Jared, Heath. (laughs) They wasn't nowhere to be found matter of fact I seen some of them same kids over in the woods hiding by trees acting like they was reading their bible over on the side of the mountain isn't it interesting how everybody wants to be around when you're having fun Isn't it interesting how everybody wants to be on the team when everything's going great, but there are a group of unloyal people when things get difficult or things get hard That's hard for me. How do you handle that? I know how not to handle it. Preacher Brown always taught us, leave the door open. Love them while they're walking out, because one day they may have to walk back in. I seen a girl at camp meeting this year. Left mad as a devil years ago. She'd come in, she said, hey. I said, welcome. Glad you're here. She said, remember, she started, said, we ain't got to talk about it. We're good. Welcome home. We're glad you're here. Now, if y'all leave, I'm going to be mean to you. But the, the rest of them, Right? About two weeks ago, I got a phone call from another man. About when, when I first got here, he's mad about something, stuff, blaming me for stuff I never even knew about. Just, yeah, you, you're this, and that, this church is that, and Brother Timmy this, and this and that. And I'm gone. Tried to set up a chance to talk to him, wouldn't talk to him. And it broke my heart that he wouldn't let me have a chance to try to fix it. But as he walks out, I love you, brother. I could show you the text. If you ever need to come back, there's a preacher here with open arms that love you and hug you when you come home. Well, that ain't ever going to happen. Two weeks ago, I get a phone call. Preacher, I need to talk to you. The Holy Ghost is ringing my bell and won't let me pray until I call and apologize to you and make things right. You didn't do nothing wrong. I did things wrong. The Lord showed me that. I operated in my flesh and I'm sorry. Now, would I have had that conversation had I been as mean as a junkyard dog when they left? You see, it's not really about them. It's God's teaching us a lesson that we don't need the people that we think we need when all we really need is Jesus. You see, in the beginning, uh, man, when I started off in evangelism, I learned how to play that piano, and my my hands on the right hand was the piano, on my left hand was the bass guitar, and my my foot was the drum kit. And I'd be, me and Becky be singing and preaching in these little tiny churches all across America, 
And in those days, God taught me how to worship all by myself. Maybe, just maybe, to teach me that if it ever gets back to that, I'll be okay then too. God wants our dependence to be on Him and not other people. And you get mad at them and you get mad at God if people walk away when in reality, maybe, just maybe, it's God teaching you and I a lesson that we need to have more faith in Him. In this room are probably people that are heartbroken, full of anxiety and stress because things are out of your control as people have walked away from you. Can I encourage you that God will never walk away from you? At the end of Paul's letters, he started talking about Demas hath forsaken me, having loved this present world. And, and Alexander the coppersmith did me much evil. And he leaves all those people and talks about all those people that were in it and around it and all these things. And he said, nevertheless, the Lord stood by me. And what a blessing it is to know that no matter what you walk through, and no matter where you go, you'll never find a place that He is not standing there right beside of you. There's this divine pruning. This, God will allow this divine pruning to happen in my life and your life. We don't prune bushes back to hurt them. We prune bushes back because we know if we prune them, they will grow into more than what they ever have been. Your limits may not be found in a place of comfort. They may be found when things get uneasy. This divine pruning. And then there's the, the faith building. There's been many times in my life when I situation something or someone walked away from me and I thought, Lord, how in the world are we ever going to fill that gap? Only for God to say, let me show you how. I don't have to know key men as long as I know the man that holds the keys. Amen. And you don't have to live in anxiety and depression and fear and worry as people walk away. Let them walk away. If they can walk away from you and they're not called to be with you, hurry up. Let them walk away. Somebody, we was in the office one day and somebody come to preach around. I think I need to go pastor a church. Preach around said, good, let me help you. Here's two weeks of your check. You're wasting my time and I'm wasting yours. Here, get started. I'll, I'll, I'll cheer you on, but go on. Because if your heart ain't here. Go. And, and so God builds our faith. Thirdly, remodel your life by expanding new horizons. Lot and Abram had this conversation. Abram says, you go one way, I'll go the other way. And Lot chooses to go somewhere where it was well watered, it was green. Matter of fact, the Bible says almost like the Garden of Eden, the garden from the beginning of time. It was beautiful, it was luscious, it was, well, it was great. And Abram chose to go the other direction. I studied these two words, Lot going towards Jordan and Abram going towards Canaan. Be very careful how you make decisions, ladies and gentlemen. Jordan, the word literally means a descender. It means going down with the flow. That Jordan River, when you go to the Holy Land, if y'all ever go with us, uh, from, from Jerusalem, everything to the Dead Sea is a downward. The, the river flows downward. And the word Jordan is a descender. It is going down. And Abram has to understand that Lot is making decisions to go to a descending place. That is, tra the trajectory is steadily down. Now, let me say, it is very hard to watch people that you love and people that you care about and people that you have prayed for, watching them have a direction downward. And you want them to know you're going the wrong way. But every time you say something to them about it, they go even faster. Am I right about it? 
Canaan, that, the place that Abram chose, that's not a descender. But Canaan is a place of humility to humble oneself. And as you study in the Bible about Canaan, it is the ultimate place of victory in the life of the child of God. You tell me who's making the right decisions about where they're choosing to live and go and serve. Lot is playing on the fence. Lot is walking away from a calling. Lot is walking away from everything. And he, and he goes and he lands over here and he's looking towards Sodom. Let me just tell you this. If you want to know where you're going in life, show me the people you hang out with. Tell me who you listen to. And show me where you're looking, where you're, what, what direction you're looking at, and I'll tell you where you're going to be headed eventually. And if you're looking at the world, and if all that matters to you is finances and, and this and that, and I've got to get my hands on all that, one day you may get it, but it'll fall through your hands like sand. While Abram chooses, I'm not going to Jordan. It may look good. How many of y'all ever heard this statement? The grass is always greener on the other side. And all Lot in his immaturity can do is, man, the grass has got to be greener over there. It's, it looks great over there. But how many of y'all have learned by now that the grass may be greener on the other side of the fence, but that's usually because there's a septic tank underneath the ground. Everything ain't what it seems to be all the time. A man leaves his wife. A wife leaves the husband or ventures out because they think the grass is going to be greener. And they're going towards Jordan. And they think, because the devil has so convinced them that this is going to take you up, you're finally going to know what happiness is all about. You're finally going to know what joy is all about. But, but Jordan never takes you up. It always takes you down. Jonah is running from the presence of God. And it says he went down into the ship. And he went down to Joppa. Every trajectory and pathway of sin takes you down. And it is the lie of the devil and the lie of hell that sin is going to make your life happier. Sin's going to make your life better. Child of God, listen to me. There's enough cases and scenario in that Bible. Go ask the prodigal son if the far country was fun. He would say that there is joy in sin for a season. But when the season is over, it bringeth forth death. You go ask all throughout that Bible. Go ask Samson. What was it like to? date Delilah man the prettiest girl in the land oh she was pretty for a little bit but as soon as I went to sleep she cut my hair and I lost my power you go ask David what it was like when he slept with Bathsheba and, he, and, and that child was born and David is the man after God's own heart but now he starts doing things he never thought he'd do he starts saying things he never thought he'd say he goes and literally has his husband her husband murdered to try to cover up the baby that was born ladies I'm telling you that Jordan will take you down 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 the, the, the the world will say it's going to take you up, but the world and sin and the flesh has no ability to take you up. It can only take you down. Be very careful how you make big decisions. Are you going towards the way of humility, humbling yourself, and in the victory of God for your life, or are you going towards the grass is greener on the other side of the fence? Sometimes you can't trust your eyes. When making a decision. The Bible says there's wisdom in a multitude of counsels. You say, preacher, I want to make a spiritual decision. Have you talked to your pastor? Have you talked to your spiritual advisors in your life? Have you talked to people that have cared about your soul? you got to know that you're making good, wise decisions based on real counsel. For the Lamb which thou seest, Give me that, that third point, fellas. Sure enough. In so many words, it's this. I don't remember exactly how I wrote it down. But venture out beyond your boundaries and find new horizons. Remodel your life and expand new horizons. As those choices are made, I couldn't help but think about this. Many people have a hard time enjoying the new and the next because they're holding on to and grieving over what used to be. God tells Abram, look out. 
Lift your head up. Look out. East, west, north, south. All of that, I'm going to give you every bit of that. But you got to look up and you got to look out and you got to have vision enough to see it. But how many people can't look up and look out because all they're doing is trying to hang on, still dealing with that free will situation, point number one, still trying to hang on to what used to be, manipulating, trying to get things back the way they used to be instead of letting God do a new thing. How many people in this room have missed out on the divine, supernatural blessing of God and God had something brand new for your life, but you could not enjoy it and you could not walk into it because you had all this baggage that you was trying to hold on to from the previous one? We were fishing years ago and uh, me and Jonathan, we were in Pascagoula, Mississippi and we were way out there and we was out, we was about 30 miles out on this big oil rig tied up to it. And man, we were catching amber jacks as big as mine. They were massive. We were having a big time. And after about an hour or two, I realized Jonathan's catching them and I'm catching them. And we're on this little boat. Jared Dixon is five feet away from me fishing off the other side of the boat. And he hadn't caught one single fish yet. He had a bait casting reel. And every time he, he let it go, it would, it would do a bird's nest on that reel and I bet Jared spent an hour and a half out of an hour and 45 minutes we've been out there trying to unwind and fix and you know us men were too prideful to ask for help right so he's sitting over there trying to unwind this and I re when I realized what's going on I said Jared are you going to fish or are you going to braid line all day because sometimes you can't do both. He said, what do you mean? I said, cut that line, put on a new hook, and start fishing. It's like you could see the light bulb go off. Oh, that is a better suggestion. <laughs> he cut that line, we put it, and it wasn't no time. He, he was having one of them amberjack like a cinder block off the bar. He was reeling that thing up. And I've always thought about that about people's life. How many people sit around in life and all they're doing is trying to unwind all this bird nest in their life? when the best thing you could do is cut that line and go to fishing. Let go of the past. Let go of what you can't control. Let, if they can walk away, let them walk away. If they can do something else, let them do something else. I can't control everybody else. I can't control what they're going to do. But I can say I refuse to give somebody else that much authority over my life. I'm going to fish. I'm going to enjoy life. I'm going to have fun. I'm going to do my best. And sometimes you got to cut the line and get to fishing. Remodel your life by expanding new horizons. And then fourthly and lastly, this is probably the hardest one to do, is remain available when needed. With, with, with not even a chapter going by. Most, most all of this is a sermon I wrote in my notebook from a class I sat through and Preacher Brown preached on this. And I remember we talked about this re remaining available when needed. It's not even a chapter later and enemies come by Lot's place and ransack it all and steal all of his stuff and war comes to Lot's place. Somebody runs and tells Abram, hey Abram, they done sabotaged Lot and they stole all his stuff and took all kinds of stuff from him. Now, the average Baptist in that circumstance, would have said, you make your bed, sometimes you got to sleep in it. I tried, I tried to talk to him, but he just would not listen. Come on, y'all. Well, that's what happens when you go towards Sodom. Everything's going to fall apart. I tried to tell him, and he wouldn't listen. You don't see any of that in Abram. And you don't ever see any of that in God. Instead, when Abram finds out that his buddy's in trouble, Abram gets all of his boys together, hundreds of men, gets them together, and goes and finds them punks that messed with Lot, and whoops them, destroys them, gets all of Lot's stuff, and brings it back. 
to Lot. Sometimes one of the hardest things you and I can do is to love the people that hurt us. When I worked for Ralph Sexton up in Asheville, there was a preacher that had been chewing on him, criticizing him. I mean, just, yeah, and, and in my opinion, I'm not here to defend. Ralph Sexton is the nicest man I've ever been around in my life. I've never, I've never heard him talk bad about one single person. He's the most kind, genuine man I've ever, and, and, and to watch this person just, yada, 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 yada. A year or two later, and I'm in a meeting with Brother Ralph. We're in a church service. And word had come to us that that person that had been attacking Brother Ralph, his marriage had fallen apart. His world had turned up crazy. He lost just all kinds of turmoil. And who did he turn to when everything fell apart? One night we came to the church. The piano player's playing. I'm done preaching. The, we came to church, and there that man was sitting in the back of the church. And I thought, boy, Brother Ralph going to get him. He going to get up there and preach and, and let that man. Instead, I watched Brother Ralph weep and cry and talk about how much he loved that brother. And I watched him get the ushers up in a church that wasn't even his church and took up an offering in that church to give that brother and to bless him. And I watched after church him get that man on the altar and they wept and they prayed together. Sometimes having peace is more important than being right. But preacher, you don't understand what they did to me. Preacher, you don't understand how they did me wrong. You are improperly categorizing. You are you. God is God. And they are them. All you can do is control you. The Bible says, follow peace with all men. And I know that's hard in the South because I got some fighters in this room. Yeah. Yeah. If you really said what you wanted to say, how many times has the Holy Ghost made you delete that comment? Sometimes peace is a whole lot more important than being right. What do you win by getting even? Never fight a battle that you don't win something if you win. Sometimes you say, well, me winning is me being right. That terms the bitterness, resent, resentment, and a hateful spirit. And you think that you're giving your enemy that poison when really bitterness is you giving yourself the poison trying to give it to your enemy. God's path is not in getting right against your enemy. God's path is living in peace and saying, I'm walking away clean. God will deal with you, but I'm going to move forward. Now that's a whole lot easier to preach than it is to live. But it could be the reason you got 15 bottles of medicine in your cabinet. It's because you're trying to carry all this stuff by yourself. You got bitterness against 15 million different people. You're mad. You're, you, you, you can't enjoy the marriage you have now because you're still hateful and angry over what happened in the past. You can't enjoy this church. You can't even trust me. You can't trust the staff because of something that happened to you at a previous church. And now you can't enjoy the job you have today because the baggage you've carried in 